charted its progress of putrefication. Hey, Doris, how are you? Good to see you. Hey, Jason, excellent to see you. Hi, Rabbi. Uh, hey, Arona. Hey, Rabbi. Hi, good to see your icon. <laughs> <laughs> good to hear your voice. Hey, Lois. Likewise. Hey, Rabbi. Hi, all. How are you? Good. Very well. Okay. Um, So um, there's lots of stuff to talk about in the Torah portion of Shmini. Shmini is a description of the dedication of the Mizbeach, of the altar, the, really the dedication of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. Um, and then, which was eight days, and um, and then the death of two of Aaron's sons for bringing what is strange fire um, to it, and then the aftermath, which was the continuing of the of the dedication, eventually. It even goes into a list of the kosher species. You know how um, in the past I've mentioned that there are two primary approaches to the Mishkan to the tabernacle, which eventually becomes the Beit HaMikdash, um, which to some degree is the model for our shuls of today, our synagogue experience. Our synagogue experience is modeled after the Beit HaMikdash and the Mishkan, although there do seem to be some differences. I saw somewhere just a snippet, a quote from Rabbi Soloveitchik, Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik from Boston and New York. Rabbi Yoshebeir Soloveitchik. Um, he was talking about why is it, this is been something that had bothered me for years. And uh, then I finally saw this snippet of a quote. Why is it that we wear shoes in the synagogue? If the synagogue is meant to, in some ways, mimic the experience of the Beit HaMikdash, or why, why is it that we wear shoes? They weren't allowed to wear shoes in the courtyard, in the areas of service, in the building the areas of service of the Beit HaMikdash, 
So why are we wearing shoes in shul? Which we're supposed to do. We're supposed to wear you're supposed to wear shoes when you're uh, davening in shul. Why is that? Shouldn't we be shoeless? So he says he that one of the differences between them, although again the design it does mimic to some degree the experience of the Beit Hamikdash, but there are some differences, and this is a reflection of one of them that when you go to the Beit Hamikdash, you are entering God's house, so to speak, but in Shul. God is entering, Hashem is entering our house. In our own homes, we wear shoes. So, uh, so too, um, so in, in shul, we wear homes, uh, shoes. So the, this is a, a subtle distinction between the Beis HaMikdash, between the Mishkan, between the Tabernacle, and our synagogue experience. Uh, but if you're looking at the Mishkan, if you're looking at the tabernacle, there are two main areas that you're interested in. There are two drivers to the experience. One of them is the Holy of Holies, which contains, is supposed to contain the Ark with the tablets in it. And the other one is the Mizbeach the sacrificial altar that's outside in the courtyard. These are, are really what you call the two drivers of what is the sanctity of the Beit HaMikdash. And uh, depending on which one you see as the dominant one, uh, you you would characterize the experience. So, for instance, the Ramban Nachmanides suggests that the Mishkan functions as a mobile Sinai. That the Sinai experience, which was so pivotal, uh, uh, so dramatically important, um, to the development of the Jewish people, the Sinai experience doesn't have to just be a, a one moment experience, but it's something that could be revisited. And then in some ways, when Moshe is having his visions at the Mishkan, which are said to be coming through the cherubs, he is in some sense, having that experience at the same place at Sinai. He's wherever he is as they're traveling, but in some ways he's, he's back at Sinai. And that the Jewish people who also had this powerful connection to Hashem's presence and heard God's word revealed, at Sinai are carrying that with them as we go through the desert and then it would it would be what is available in the base Hamikdash. That would be what you'd call a Kodesh HaKadoshim centric vision of the Mishkan of the Beit HaMikdash. And it because that's where the Sinai experience is happening. Then there's the experience at the altar, which is the korbanos, which is the offering. And if you're looking, <clears throat> if you're looking at the Mishkan from the perspective of the Mizpeach, then the purpose of the Mishkan is unification, 
with God that comes about through the offering of a korban. It's a vehicle, as we've spoken of, it's a vehicle for unification, of bringing us close to God. And you could even argue that this represents part of why there is a disagreement about the Mishkan. There, there is a school of thought led by the Ramban, Nachmanides, which suggests that we always were supposed to have the Mishkan. We were always supposed to have the Mishkan. It had, whether there was a golden calf or not, we would have always had a Mishkan. And that accounts for the order of the discussion because we're told that they were gathering materials and received command uh, to build the Mishkan right after the Sinai experience um, before there was a golden calf. This, the narrative of the golden calf only happens halfway through the discussion of the Mishkan, of the building of the Mishkan. Uh, that suggests that even before the golden calf, we were supposed to have the Mishkan. Um, but the other school, the one who um, suggests that we only have the Mishkan as a, because there was a golden calf, and that's a school that includes Rashi. The most, the most uh, definitive writing about it, I think, is found in the Sforno, which is a medieval commentary on the Torah. Um, Rabbi Obadiah Sforno, I think was his first name. Obadia. Um So that group would just say that the Torah doesn't always present things in the historical order, in the chronological order that they happen. Sometimes for pedagogical reasons, the Torah um, will put things out of order. And so it did here. Really, it didn't, it wasn't necessary till after the Egel. And if you were really chronologically presenting the events, it would have only been at the Ego story would have been first, and then you would have had the discussion about building, putting together uh, the Mishkan. So you could suggest, uh, you'd have to find every one of those commentaries and see if it stays consistent with them, but certainly the Ramban's position is seems consistent, that according to the Ramban, who holds there was always gonna be a Mishkan, uh, he's looking at the Mishkan from the point of the Holy of Holies. Um, and um, the the Holy of Holies, the mobile Sinai aspect of it would have been important no matter what uh, happened afterwards, being able to carry that with us and revisit that energy um, that closeness to God, that would have been important no matter what. Um, if you were of the, uh, and, and so the Mishkan w would have been something we would have had no matter what. Whereas according to the others, you might argue that they would be of the position that it's the korbanos, it's the offerings that are the primary vehicle and the mover of the Mishkan and uh, that would have been something that would have been about repair, the kind of repair that would have been needed after something like the golden calf. There is another interesting feature of the Mishkan, of the Holy of Holies. You have the Sinai connection, because you have the tablets in there. But there's also cherubs. There's also cherubs. Yeah, cherubs, cherubs everywhere. Yeah, the Mishkan does have it because it has them in the tapestry. Also, the cherubs. Um, the cherubs call you back to the garden. So in the Mishkan's design, 
there's a cover to the ark and on the ark's cover are cherubs cherubs are a type of angelic figure and um, in the Gemara, they characterize them as having the face, face of children. They are angels, but they have like a face of children. And they are facing each other on the cover of the, of the ark. And we know that after Adam and Chava, after Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they're, they're, God makes the determination to have cherubs standing on the path to the tree of life. Is that where they were? Yes. They were on the path to the tree of life and they had flaming swords, um, which was meant to keep Errant. humans <laughs> away. Uh, away from contact with the with the tree of life so interestingly you have these cherubs that are on the cover of the ark that are over the tablets and in the garden you had cherubs that were protecting tree. the tree of life in the garden. Rabbi Foreman uh, points out that the term tree of life only appears in the story of the garden and one other place. That other place is in Proverbs, in Mishle, where it says, which is something that we sing in Shul when we are wrapping up the Torah after the Torah reading. It is a tree of life to those who cling to it, those who um, rely on it or rest against it are, are happy or wealthy or So um, that suggests that this is some kind of reenactment, that if you look at the design of the Ark, it's a, it's a, it's an homage to a reenactment of a continuing opportunity uh, available to, in this case, the Jewish people, to that the that the tablets themselves. Because what is it referring to in Mishlei? It's referring to the um, the Torah, to the wisdom of the Torah. So the Torah. The wisdom of the Torah is a tree of knowledge to those who, a tree of life to those who cleave to it. Tree of life to those who cleave to it. So. It's a connection. Right. So the Holy of Holies is both uh, a Sinai and a Garden of Eden, the connection to the Garden of Eden. If you look in Midrashim that speak about what happens at Sinai, there are elements of the event characterized mostly in the Midrash that connect to the Garden, to the Garden of Eden. Um, there was said to be an impact from eating the tree something that entered the, the human experience after eating from the tree that was repaired at Sinai. The, in the language of the Zohar, it was Pascha Zumasam. 
the filth, whatever entered the people at the in the garden from eating the tree left. Um, and then at the golden calf, it it uh, came, back. came back. But the but it but so there there is a a line point point of contact between Sinai and the Garden of Eden to uh, to be explored, and that and this would be one of those places that you would look at if you were trying to plumb some of the secrets of that connection between the Garden of Eden and and uh, and the Sinai experience. Because like Rabbi Foreman has. Yes, I'm sure he has. Even if he hasn't spoken of it publicly. Yep. I, no, I know. <laughs> so um, here we have both elements of Sinai and elements of the garden. And both of them are characterized as the tree of life. We're about to, we're approaching a pilgrimage festival, the first pilgrimage festival of the year, Pesach. And it would suggest that on Pesach, the people are meant to gather and to some degree approach the tree of life. The thing is the tree of life is in a room which is not available to the average Jew. It's hardly available to anybody. It's only available to the Kohen Godel, the high priest, on Yom Kippur. Um, otherwise, he's not entering the room. The, um, but it, if, if you stood back, there would be a drone's eye view where you'd see like all the people sort of coming together and gathering close to where this is characterized again by the Torah, which is represented by the tablets and the cherubs, which are over it. Rabbi Foreman suggests that the difference between the cherubs over the ark and the cherubs in the garden is the cherubs in the garden are trying, to, are trying to keep you away. No, they're trying to keep you away from right. the from the uh, tablets, whereas the cherubs on the ark are sort of inviting communication. Makes sense. Yes. <sighs> Why couldn't we go near the tree in the garden? Is that so? The question is why. Uh, Chav is asking, Kana is asking why we can't um, approach the tree of life in the garden. And that's because they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, so it was and God, right, it was, and he didn't want them to have access to the tree of life in the state they were in, mm. which is they had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, I'm glad you asked that because the question is why is now different? Why why is now different? Um, why now would we be invited to partake of the tree of life when in the garden they he didn't want them to have access to it? He actually sets up this sort of interesting conundrum about the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. If you look at the description of the trees, so this is in the, I think the second chapter of, of Bereshis, when it's going back over, uh, at this point, it's going over in, in detail the creation of the human and the separation of male and female um, into two entities. So uh, 
it talks about the trees and it it mentions that the tree of life is in the midst of the garden and there's also a tree of knowledge of good and evil so his question is where was was the human immortal at the when they were created were they created to be immortal mm -hmm. or were they not created immortal so when adam is warned of, against eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil he's told that on the day you eat it, you will die, which Nachmanides explains means you will be subject to death. You'll be subject to death. Mm. So that sounds like we started off immortal. Human beings started off immortal. Uh, but once we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and, and, and evil, mortality ensued. But there was also a tree of life which we had access to because it said you're allowed to eat from all the trees of the garden. God, God says you're allowed to eat from all the trees of the garden except. except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So we had access to the tree of life before we ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And um, so what would be the point of having access to the tree of life if you were immortal, if we started off immortal, Good point. what would be the point of eating from something called the tree of life? Because doesn't that sound like the tree of life is immortality? Mm -hmm. So which is it? Are, did we start off mortal or did we start off immortal? So he wanted to suggest um, a state of uncertainty. <laughs> Sort of like quantum mechanics, like some you know something from the world of quantum We're mechanics. Way of analytical. Or 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 yeah, both uh, mm. mortal and immortal. In other words, that we it it isn't completely determined uh, until we take an action. Our choices, if we eat from the tree of life, then we're That's immortal. Not, well, that would be nourishment. The tree of life would. Is your nourishment right whether you're mortal or immortal right but wouldn't all trees be nourishment of some what if it was of just some kind yes like it, it's eating is like a nice except thing. the tree of I mean, but evil is a whole different story it's not nourishment no, right except for the tree of knowledge of good right. and evil i'm saying the other trees are fruit trees or, or whatever god says to adam Autumn and Chava, that you can eat from the trees and the herbs, etc. Before, in the in the first description, so this seems to be more than no, just a source of nourishment. The sense is that it's something um, deeper, deeper yeah. right? And typically, it's thought of that. In fact, that seems to have been the problem in the state we're in. You don't want to have immortality. You don't want to have immortality. You, we, we need death. Yes. Do you imagine how many people would be here? That's not, that's <laughs> not why we would need death. <clears throat> um, but again, the, the purpose of life and death, maybe we'll get to that in a minute, but, but right now, so you had this, tree of life you have the tree of knowledge of good and evil the result from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is that we're subject we're mortal which would imply they were immortal before then but we had access to a tree of life before it seems like the tree of life access to it is immortal life what would you need a tree of life for uh beforehand so that's why he suggested that you're in this um preparatory stage you're in a stage before it's determined um he want to maybe you're both mortal and immortal or you have the potential for mortality and immortality uh and then some action has to be taken in order to make that determination he compares it to later on when the torah talks 
where God says, I place before you good and bad. I place before you life and death. Choose life. Um, so at that point, it seems like it's not determined. It's only determined once you t take action. One, the choice in one direction is life. The choice in the other direction is death, which would mean that you're somehow at a stage before when you're being called to uh, to make that choice. That also, see, you know, the language calls you to reflect back at the, on the choice between the tree of knowledge and the and the tree of life. The language itself, tov ra, good and bad, which was the language from before, life and death. So that language of choosing life later on seems to call wants to call us back to the to the experience in the garden right so it ends up that we were in according to his suggestion you're in some kind of non-determined place Limbo. and our, our next actions or further actions are going to determine which one uh how we connect now the tree of life was still available to them but he didn't want them to have access to it you could speculate as to why not and uh, one thought that comes to me is that we need death in order to motivate us in our present situation that if if we didn't think we were going to die we wouldn't have as much motivation to procrastinate yeah to correct our trajectory we and uh, so you now there's a discussion about what happens after we die what first of all what is death what is death and what is life so the simplest ex, uh, description of death is that it is the separation between the body and the soul that the body and soul come together when body and soul come together that's um the beginning of human life and the end of human life is when the body and soul separate. Obviously things are never that neat, but that would be the simplest explanation about what is meant by, by death. So, and, and then again, life would be the experience that we have of hum as humans of uh, body and soul together. So life would be body and soul together. Death would be when body and soul separate. But you, the, there are deeper notions of life and death. The Talmud says that the, the wicked, even while they're alive, are called dead. And the righteous, even after they've died, are called alive. So clearly there are more profound states that are referred to by the terms death and life, and they may be more connected to the Torah as a tree of life. The notion that somehow there's a bond available through Torah that is vivifying, that, um, that is life and the connection to the Torah is alive. Um, and uh, the severance, the disconnection from Torah is characterized as a, as a kind of death, death. And there's, you know, perhaps more layers so that this is a term that has meaning on, on, on several levels. Uh, if you look at the Torah, this is one of the issues that 
as covered in my museum of things you would expect to find in the Torah, <laughs> but they're not. Uh, the Torah does not discuss in any detail what happens after we die. There is, a, there are hints to continuity. Mm -hmm. There are hints to the idea that the soul or continues um, after it is separated from the body. Um, but there's no description of that state. There's no discussion of it. And, and so the question is, why doesn't the Torah talk about what happens after we die? And one explanation that um, seems to come from the from the commentary of Rav Shimshon Fall Hirsch is that uh, it wasn't deemed important. Hmm. We don't need to know what is going to happen after we die because that'll be after we die. Right now we're here and we're meant to focus on what is here. And if you spent your t whole time just thinking about the next stage then you're not going to be in the present. You're not going to be fully invested in the present. And therefore we won't be taking um, advantage of the opportunity that is in the now. So therefore the, we're not told what's going to happen next. So leave it to us to, to decide we're still going to try to carve out some kind of understanding about what happens next. We're very curious people. And so uh, now we have books and books and books that talk about what happens after you, you die, even though all of that information is based on a few kernels of data. Uh, we know more about the life experience of dinosaurs than we know about what is going to happen after we die. And there's, even though there's just some bones, a few bones, um, maybe a couple eggs, fossilized eggs um, from dinosaurs, they've pieced together lots of uh, information. They've extrapolated a great deal from that little bit of information. And, um, but, and so has happened with the crumbs of data available about what's going to happen after we die. There's been a lot extrapolated from that. And so you could have, you know, you have books that have it all laid out. The first couple hours, this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, then that's going to happen. Then you go to this kind of place, then this, etc. cetera. Um, even though it appears that we could have gotten by without knowing any of that. So if you ask yourself, so why did they do that? And why do they present that information to us? So it seems like the motivation of, of a lot of the scholars who are doing that was that we need to be motivated now to design a lifestyle that will best set us up for the next stage. And, and if you present it like that, then people are motivated today to make changes in their life uh, and decisions in their life that will um, a, a affect what is going to happen later on. And so it's a useful tool. It's a motivational tool. So giving us that information helps motivate us in order to put things in line. So, um, so again, you could argue that this is the advantage of of not giving us access to the tree of life um, in the garden because we need the motivation of death in order to straighten out what went wrong 
by eating from the tree of knowledge uh, or, or the choice to, to eat from the tree of knowledge of, uh, of good and evil. On several occasions, I have brought up with you the topic of reincarnation. <laughs> the soul goes from one to the other. Right. So um, the notion of reincarnation is not discussed overtly in the in Tanakh. It's not discussed overtly in the Talmud. But it is very much a part of the theology uh, of present day Jews. You will not, I don't think, find a sector of the Jewish population that does not ascribe to the notion of reincarnation. Reincarnation would mean this is not resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead is a phenomenon that will occur sometime after Mashiach comes, could be a long time after Mashiach comes, could be a short time. But there's a phenomenon that is described also in poetry, not with a lot of detail, that at some point body and soul come back together. And that is uh, according to many, is a permanent solution a, or, or relatively permanent solution. Um, according to Maimonides, it's it, it might be a more fleeting uh, have thing. Bodies. What? Yeah. So I don't know how to <clears throat> I don't know how to resolve that problem with reincarnation. <laughs> but that's resurrection of the dead. Reincarnation is that after a person dies, their soul leaves the present body and now is connected to another body and will grow up. You know, in other words, it's born again into another body and it lives the light, uh, another life. The, and the, the theology of reincarnation, of reincarnation is discussed in, um, the writings of Rabbi Isaac Luria um, and in other Kabbalistic works. But it's made its way into Sephardic Jews, hold of it, Ashkenazic Jews, hold of it, and all the varieties seem to hold of it. Almost, almost everyone, and, and not only in their mystical teachings, which would be reserved just for the mystics, but in stories that are told, Hasidic stories, Fardic stories, and even Litvish stories told um, about incidents of, uh, you know, to children. These are stories that are that are told to everybody. I once was um, with a, a group of young men and I asked them, how many of them have heard a story that included a reincarnation at Gilgal, which is how it's referred to in, uh, in Hebrew. I asked them if, uh, how many of them have heard stories every single one had. They're in Hasidic stories. They're in, 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 uh, in almost every tradition, you have these stories of, of reincarnation. And in reincarnation, and it seems like it is the most likely, if you're looking at the, when the mystics talk about it, uh, it seems like it's the most likely scenario. If somebody, if you, if you, if you wanted to know uh, what's most likely to happen to you after you die, it is most likely, according to this theology, which again seems to be accepted, I have a student, Yinan Gurvich, who sent me a quote that uh, from the Stipler, Rabbi Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky, um, a blessed memory, who in that quote, he says flat out, it does, it does seem like we accept the notion of reincarnation. We accept the notion of reincarnation. So the most likely scenario for any of us is that after we pass away, our soul is gonna go into another body. There is a discussion about the fact that we move to a like a holding situation for a moment and our right soul 
<laughs> our soul gets asked if it wants to. Yeah, our soul gets asked if it wants to because um, there's stuff that wasn't fixed yet. And that seems to be the goal of reincarnation is either to accomplish all that the soul needs to accomplish. It didn't get to accomplish it in this lifetime, so it needs more time. Or to fix mistakes that were made in this lifetime. Uh, so it's going to get an opportunity uh, to do that in, in a next life. So there is discussion of, of the fact that it's that there is a choosing, that the soul knows what it's coming into in that interim period. It knows what it's coming into, um, but it doesn't, uh, and it gets to choose. And But most likely we're going to say yes. I have a, we have a little group that studies together um, and our mystic in the group, he, he said one time, when you get asked, tell him you don't want to come back. <laughs> Because it's worth whatever suffering is going to have to happen in order to cleanse us. That's much easier for the soul than whatever suffering goes on in reincarnation. So he's saying, you got to prepare now so that when you get asked the question, you tell them you don't want to come back. I'm not telling you to do that. He he said that. I am. I'm not telling you. Right. I'm not telling you. Yeah. And some of them are coming back as creatures. I've heard stories of coming back as a brain of barley that somebody come back as a grain of barley so you um anyway so so the thing is and this was a sort of uh annoying bothersome issue to me which is if we actually believe that and it does seem like we do why don't we teach it why don't more people know it why is it a mystery i this group that I was learning with, we learned the Sefer, the Bahir, which is a mystical work. And the Bahir is one of the earliest works that references reincarnation. And over there, the students didn't know about it. He, their, <clears throat> the students approached their master about suffering, and uh, he talks to them about reincarnation. And it was clear they had never heard of reincarnation. So it was not even if this is something that we accept as how things play out, then why, why don't we teach it? And then the, the real question is that if you did teach it, you would, you would solve almost every question about suffering. You, I wouldn't say solve, but you would you would resolve the the deepest problem of suffering, the theological problem of suffering. Why do the righteous suffer? Why do children suffer, etc.? You would you it gets resolved with reincarnation because you're saying that a soul came here to fix something. It chose this life and uh, beforehand, and uh, it wanted it wanted this, and this is a tikkun. This is a fixing of it. And I can tell you that it is used. Uh, we, Atsipi and I, had a baby that passed away, and uh, it, it passed away after one day. You know, it was born and lived for the baby lived for one day, and. The, a social worker approached the uh, Zippy and because the baby was whisked away. She didn't get to spend time with the baby because the, the hospital that we gave birth in, that she gave birth in, did not have a NICU, didn't have a, a neonatal intensive care. So they had an arrangement with a nearby hospital, Shari Tzedek. And so the baby, I went with the baby to Shari Tzedek and I spent the day, you know, it was a Friday night. I spent, you know, Shabbos with the baby till the baby passed away. Um, but but Sippy never got a chance to um, spend any time with the baby. Right. The next thing she heard, I had walked back to the hospital and told her the baby had passed away. So uh, the social worker was suggesting that in order for Sippy to get closure she should actually hold the baby even though the baby 
was no longer alive, and also that we should have a burial and that there should be a burial place. So that would give a sense of finality um, uh, to it. So I'm sure the social worker had lots of experience that um, that led her to suggest that. But I called her Moshe Shapiro, bless memory. Of course. He yelled at me over the phone. Did he he yelled at me over the phone. Do not do this. And part of what he said was, he said, this child was not meant for this world. In other words, it, it had a tikkun to, the soul had a tikkun that it had to do. It was a one day tikkun, but it doesn't need a memory here. We bury people because they lived and impacted lives on this planet. This baby didn't, does not have a interaction with the planet. It was here, I mean, the briefest interaction, not something that warrants a, a burial and, 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 or, and he was very against her uh, having to hold the, the baby, et cetera. He didn't like any of the advice, so we did not follow that advice. We've talked about it a few times since then, and uh, she's not sure, you know, from her perspective, she's not sure. There definitely is something incomplete and painful yeah. that she experiences that's different than what I'm experiencing about it. But there he evoked it. He evoked it that this is the case. There Also, there are people who evoke this with children with disabilities or and children that are suffering. You'll hear reincarnation brought in for those, and people will be comforted with that. A soul came in for a tikkun. It knew what it was coming for. It came for the tikkun. It came to fix something. And it's okay. It's going, you know, the, it's next stage. It, it will, it, it doesn't even need Torah and mitzvahs anymore. And it's next stage, you know, it, it'll get to move on. It won't have perhaps even have to go through reincarnations again, etc. cetera. Um, but it resolves, as far as I'm concerned, the deep problem of suffering because you have a system to explain it. And also, in general, it's a pretty fuzzy and uh, nice idea. Uh, broadly, people seem to take well to the idea of reincarnation, the notion that somebody could be living on somewhere else and again and hasn't completely disappeared into the ether. You know, that that's something that... Uh, that is a comfort to people broadly, not just people in that kind of situation. So why don't we teach it? So the only explanation I've heard for why we don't teach it broadly is something similar, which is that if you taught reincarnation, you won't feel motivated to work on the now because you'll start to develop an idea that whatever I don't fix now will get fixed in another life. And this will become a, another version of the immortality after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What were you saying? Well, I feel like, and I've studied a little bit about reincarnation, but aside from what I've learned, it's sort of like, well, I'm not going to change my eating habits because I'll do that tomorrow. But in the meantime, I'm getting more overweight, and more diabetic and whatever. Like, wouldn't you want to fix it for, because it's going to just going to get bigger down the road. Like, well, I don't agree with that argument as to why we don't teach it. So I think we have to teach it because we can't understand our troubles. First of all, it can help us make peace with our troubles. And secondly, if we know that I heard a story about a guy that became like this incredibly successful poker player at 15. I was just making off the charts money. And then some, what do you call those guys? McCobbles? McCobble. McCobble told him in a past lifetime, he gambled away everything. And like the second he heard that, he totally lost his taste for gambling and took his life in a completely different direction. And I'm like, how powerful is that information that he was like, headed on one path and then somebody who was able to see beyond this world could give him information that helped him 
I mean, like, what if you found out that in your past three lifetimes, you had drank yourself to death and now you were drinking a lot again and that you get like three bites of the apple and on the fourth bite, maybe you can come back as a grain of barley. Wouldn't you be so motivated? Like, I don't want to come back as a grain of barley unless. We could this. ask people how it worked in the long run. I know there are stories about how people turn their life around. Just my life experience has told me that there are very few people who do that in a way that is sustained right. from a conversation or a piece of information. But my life experience, that doesn't mean that we couldn't find out something different. I'm always open to different uh, results or, or thoughts. But my life experience has taught me that there are people that have what they characterize as a transformational moment that comes from information that they received um, that very few people are able to sustain. Almost everybody that, let's say, dieted, almost everybody that went on a diet had, and let's say lost a good amount of weight, would characterize a change that they think is going to last forever. Almost everybody that kicked a habit or, uh, you know, quit uh, something that was self-destructive would say they had that moment. But very, very few are sustained in the long run. But some so, are. Yeah. So some might argue, fine. So the some people might argue that for this, again, this is with Simon Jacobson who was the one who suggested something like this, that it could be this is why it's been hidden that uh, because they felt like it in the hands of most people, this is not going to be useful. Maybe he's relying and maybe others are relying on the fact that if somebody really needs to know and it will make a difference, they'll end up finding out because I'm telling you about it. Obviously, there's not nobody. It's not that nobody knows about it, but it's not taught because perhaps he's suggesting. Again, we don't know. They just didn't teach it. They didn't teach it. Why did they not teach it? So you had a speculation that maybe there is uh, uh, the, the access to the tree of life. Maybe I was speculating. I don't know. One of us was speculating <laughs> that the path to the tr to tree of life is blocked because we need death to, uh, to motivate us, the, the specter of death to motivate us to make a change now. If we live forever, we wouldn't be motivated to make a change now. Yeah, so he he I mean, seemed to live forever. Right. So he know, seemed to be to speculating God. that perhaps that's the case with reincarnation. That if that you would have a similar kind of he didn't connect it, but I'm but he, he said a similar thing about reincarnation. That people will say, whatever I don't fix not. So how do they do it? They'll tell you you don't want to come back. It's painful for the soul to come back. But I I know that in I can hear that as a point of theology, but I don't see how that is. And so maybe I'll think that, uh, you know, if, if I mess up, don't worry, I'm going to get to fix it next time. You're right. saying that you know of people that heard about something or heard about people that heard about something from their past life and that caused them permanent change, right? I'm suggesting to you that a couple of the, my life experience suggests to me that those would be rare. Very few people make sustained right. ch uh, uh, changes in their life because of something, even an experience they had. Maybe more of, like, they have deja vu. If, I had a huge deja vu when you started your lesson. Oh my gosh, it was like overwhelming me. About All right, I went way too long. I'm uh, <laughs> sorry about that. You never uh, go too long. It's yeah. okay. All right. Um, I'm very grateful that we got a chance to share. Um, and I look forward to doing some more sharing next week. I look forward to, hey, Thanks, look who's Rabbi. there. Steve, you man. Very good to see you. It's mm -hmm. excellent to see all of you. And uh, I'm very grateful that I get to learn with you. Be well. Bye bye. Hey, Rabbi. Okay. Bye bye, Arona. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, thank Jason. Bye. Thank you. Look at that, Ken. 
Even Ken was on tonight. Ken wow. Adler? No. Bye. Bye-bye, Raven. Bye. Bye. Okay. <laughs>